name is Scott Silverman. I'm the chairman and CEO of Ericship Corporation, soon to be after November 10th, Positive ID Corporation. Uh, with me today from Verichip is uh, Bill Caragol, our president. Bill, are you out there? Where's, where's the He's out front pushing people in. And Allison Tomek, our vice president of corporate communications. Uh, from receptors here today is uh, Dr. Robert Carlson. There's Billy just walked in the back. Dr. Robert Carlson is the president and chief scientist of receptors. And also from receptors is Randy Geisler, who is one of the owners of the business. So I appreciate it if you say hello to those people on the way out. We're here today to talk about something that has garnered much attention over the last couple months, which are two exciting projects that Verichip is doing with receptors. And those projects are a glucose sensing microchip, which is a project that we've had underway for approximately a year and a half with receptors, uh, and also our virus detection system, starting with the H1N1 virus and evolving to other viruses. Obviously, we have the standard safe harbor here. Introductions have been made. So before I introduce Bob or Dr. Carlson to go over what phase two of our glucose sensing microchip development project is all about, as well as the H1N1 virus detection system, for those of you that don't have the history of Verichip and don't have the history of the receptor's relationship with Verichip, I think it's important to spend five or ten minutes on that just so you understand how this relationship has evolved and how the technology has evolved. In 2001, Verichip started as a corporation based on this little microchip which evolved out of the animal world uh, and our applications are in the human world. That's them. Ooh. It's still out. There we go. Um, the microchip is for human applications and was originally designed to identify high-risk patients and their medical records, a personal health record in essence, when a patient presents unconscious or non-communicative in an emergency room situation. In October of 2004, the FDA cleared this little product and the system around it, the personal health record system, as a class two medical device, as the predicate class two medical device for implantable RFID or radio frequency identification technology. A few, few years later, Digital Angel Corporation, a company that used to own a majority interest in Verichip, received a patent to put an embedded biosensor on the end of this little chip. And that's really where this story begins about the glucose sensing microphone. In February of 2007, Verichip did its IPO and raised approximately $22 million. And soon thereafter, with some cash in our pockets, we entered into our first partnership with Receptors to take this little chip and evolve it from an identification product only to a diagnostic tool to be used in glucose sensing applications. In theory, to take a little chip this size, inject it in the arm of a diabetic or in the side of a diabetic, and use an external scanner in order to take the daily sugar readings rather than having to prick their fingers. We started the development of that project with receptors. In fact, we had a phase one meeting here about a year and a half ago. Was anyone at that meeting a year and a half ago? All right, so for those that were here, you're familiar with it. And, uh, and soon thereafter, we halted the project because Verichip had an opportunity to sell one of its main assets, being our wearable RS division, not the implantable, but wearable products for maternity wards and nursing homes. The Stanley works for $48 million. And we did that in July of last year. Time went by, and it was clear that the intent of the prior majority shareholder was to liquidate the business and distribute the cash to the shareholders. And, in fact, there was a major distribution to all of the shareholders of Verichip. However, in November of 2008, rather than letting this implantable human application die on the vine, I personally bought those shares of Verichip from the prior majority shareholder so that we could continue to develop the intellectual property and in turn the products associated with our RF business and associated with our health applications. In April, we rejuvenated our relationship. April of this year, we rejuvenated our relationship with receptors and soon thereafter received the escrow proceeds from the Stanley deal, which gave us additional working capital in order to move forward with the receptors development. And that is when we made the decision to focus on the underlying technology that receptors had, the intellectual property that they had, 
as it relates to sensor applications and surface applications, far beyond the glucose sensing microchip, but rather to take it to a virus detection system, an early detection system, starting with the H1N1 virus, but as you'll see in Bob's presentation, it's not just for H1N1. Once the system is developed and commercialized, it can quickly adapt to any pandemic, medical, or environmental situation. Amazing technology, amazing IT, and, and Bob will go through it with you. But before I turn it over to him, I need to do a little bit of a promote here. Verichip announced a few months ago that we have acquired and are merging with Steel Vault Corporation uh, off of the bulletin board. That closing is tentatively uh, proposed to occur on November 10th. And when it does occur, we will do a formal name change for positive ID. So keep an eye on that. And it's the first time we've actually unveiled our logo. So you're seeing the positive ID logo for the first time on this board. So without further ado, you're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to Bob about the glucose sensing micro as well as the early uh, detection virus triage system. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Carlson, and again, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Scott. Thank you all for coming to hear about our technology and how we're going to solve two very important problems in the area of clinical diagnostics. So our technology platform of receptors is built around what we call smart materials. What that really means, our core technology, is that we can take any surface and we can modify it to have the binding or the ability to bind things however we want. It's very important that we're able to do that because virtually every diagnostic, every implantable, many other kinds of uh, applications of this technology require taking a surface and giving it the characteristics you want. Well, our core technology is also our core competence, and again, it's the surface functionalization. We have a technology with a strategy with receptors. In many cases, technology companies get kind of lost behind the idea that they have this whiz bang technology, and that's not really important to us. What's important to us is how can we get it into products that will make a difference in the marketplace, and in this case, also for human health. So we're really focused in the area of diagnostics and sensors. Two things that we bring to this is that our technology is we're really a chemistry company. We don't use biological reagents, which means we have very quick turnaround in our development cycles. Also, the products are very stable. Also, they're scalable in their economics. Most of biotech and biological reagents aren't very scalable. They stay very expensive, even if you're producing 100,000 liters versus, say, 10 liters in a reactor batch. In chemistry, you have the economics of scale. So the first of the two products I want to tell you about is the in vivo glucose sensor. So some of you are here. You heard when we introduced that we were going to be working on this project. Now I want to tell you about the success that we had in brief and then also where we're going. So the idea then behind the product is that for a diabetic, some of you in this room may be diabetics, you certainly know diabetics, they have to go through the multiple times per day of pricking their finger. It may be a fairly fine micro prick these days compared to what they used to have to do, but when you have to do that thousands of times per year potentially, it begins to accumulate, you get scar tissue, you get a lot of pain with the process. As importantly though, if the glucose concentration can be monitored on a more continuous or more easily derivable basis, it's going to improve patient outcome because their glucose is not going to fluctuate as dramatically as it does at times these days, especially for juveniles. What's critical about projects that we've embarked on is that, as you probably are all aware, people have been trying to develop an functional, usable, in the market, in vivo glucose monitoring device for decades. The problem that they've run into is that a particular company or organization may decide that they're good at the biostable interface part. How do you put it into a body and get it to still be stable so the body doesn't wall it off? Or they might be good at the signal processing part. How do you take a sensing event and turn it into a signal that can then be used by the patient? What they don't do is take all these components and think about them as an integrated package, which is what we did at the start. We have expertise in the closed cycle sensing system, which we'll talk about we have partners who have expertise in the biostable interface, 
and then of course bringing in very 